I, I wanted to talk a little bit about work I've been doing on, on uh, biofuels and biofuels markets. Um, I'll apologize up front for being an economist, and, and <laughs> this, this will sound very much like an economist talking. Um, so really, you know, I've, I titled this talk, and I realized the title wasn't quite right, so I put the subtitle, Perverse Effects of Alternative Fuel Public Sector Policies. And they, they do have some very perverse effects, and those are things that I'm, I'm sort of interested in. But uh, moreover, I'm interested in how we can miss those perverse effects by not really looking very closely at how the policies work. And worse, how not looking at those policies work can make us think we're doing something really good when we're doing something really bad. Okay, that's, that's sort of the way I'd like to, to frame this. And, and first to get into this, let's talk a little bit about the reasons for these biofuel policies. I think, I think majority of these people are, are well aware of, but you gotta recognize different people have different motives for putting these in place. Um, so we have a whole bunch of different goals with each of these policies. Uh, you know, first, we're talking about you know, increasing domestic energy production because there are a lot of people who really think we need to be independent of everybody else when it comes to producing our own fuel. And this gives us some diversification, if you will. Um, and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. These are things that I think almost everybody thinks about. Uh, there's also an argument that we want to nurture an infant industry. Um, there's a lot of reasons why this is potentially a really bad argument. One would be that uh, biofuels have been around since before the New Testament. Um, <laughs> but in any case, it's a small, or it was at one point, a small industry in the US. And so maybe it needed some, some sort of spur to get going, to get to a critical level where we, you know, it would support itself. Um, and finally, to create some supports for agriculture. And, and really, this seemed to be a lot of the push and why this became so popular so fast and also why it became so unpopular so fast uh, is how much it was doing to try and support agriculture. But the issue with it, the issue with all of these multiple goals and trying to have one set of policies that meets 15 different types of goals is that the policies, first off, have to miss the mark on something, and second off, have to be so complicated that it can be very difficult to figure out what they're doing in terms of each one of those goals, right? And so to meet these goals, what did we do? We didn't just put out one policy, we put out like dozens. We have biofuel consumption subsidies. There used to be, and until very, very recently, a, a tax credit for people who, uh, well, for blending biofuels, uh, particularly ethanol in the US, uh, but others as well. And there are also similar sorts of, of tax credits in Europe and in the rest of the world for uh, biodiesel and other, other things along those lines. There are blend mandates as well as just consumption mandates. So actually the government saying, you know, this percent of fuel has to be biofuels or has to be this particular type of ethanol. We have de facto mandates and I'll, I'll mention one of those uh, is essentially Long, long ago, we used to use this uh, uh, additive in our fuels, MTBE, and it became clear that it had some rather detrimental effects on the environment. And because of a particular court case, uh, it looked like anybody who was using MTBE was gonna be on the hook for some really big amounts of money. And that made it unsustainable, that risk. And so people switched over to using ethanol as their additive rather than MTBE, uh, which essentially mandated that we must use a certain percentage of ethanol in our fuel. So it was a de facto mandate, even though the government itself didn't set out as a policy in that, that respect. Um, there are direct production subsidies, right? We'll pay you to produce this. Uh, as well, on not, not just on biofuels themselves, but on the, the things that go into biofuels to make those cheaper. Uh, there are the import tariffs and quotas, um, which for a long time drove a pretty big wedge in between the prices of biofuels coming in from Brazil versus those being produced here. Um, this, this is really the sort of infant industry uh, support, if you will. And finally, there are these sustainability thresholds, and, and these are hard to explain, and they're also the most ridiculous of the policies we have. Um, it, it's something essentially that says, you know, we'll have all of these policies in place for any fuel that can demonstrate a 20% reduction in greenhouse gases relative to a, you know, 
a similar uh, amount of gasoline, okay? And why does that become hard to, you know, to really deal with? Well, because showing that 20% is very dependent on the methodology you use and what sorts of assumptions you make about how it's replaced, right? So, for example, do you just take the energy equivalent of a gallon of gasoline and you say this is 20% less uh, greenhouse gas, or do you take what would actually be displaced, right? Is, is, is that gasoline, that gallon of gasoline, actually going to disappear or not? And usually it doesn't disappear, it just gets sold into some other market, right? So it's a good question as to whether that really makes sense as a concept. Now, let me talk a little bit about some of the economics behind this. Intuitively, how much would you be willing to pay for, say, an amount of ethanol? Uh, if you're a consumer, it's your opportunity cost. It's what you could pay otherwise to, say, move your car a certain number of miles. Right? So in this case, we might think you'd be willing to pay the price of gasoline, PG, for an amount of ethanol that would move your car about the same amount as a gallon of gasoline. Right? And if that's the case, if that's the trade-off, then the markets should all equilibrate to where gas prices and ethanol prices basically equal each other once we transform for that amount of, of you know, ability to move your car, the amount of energy contained in it, right? And if those two equilibrate, remember, ethanol, at least in the US, is being produced with corn or sugar, if we're talking about Brazil, right? And so those prices should start to equilibrate, right? There should be some sort of competition that, that drives it so there's not excess profit to be made there, because if there was excess profit, more people would get in and drive the prices down until they did come into this equilibrium. That's the very, very simple story. But a couple other things might happen, okay? And there are a couple of things that might sound like outside chances, but they're really important, actually. What happens if the price, for example, of a gallon of gasoline, when you transform it into, uh, you know, ethanol price and then transform it into the corn price, what if that price is actually lower than the value of corn for some other purpose? For example, feeding somebody, right, or feeding cattle. Um, if that's lower than that, then no, we shouldn't see this. In fact, we should see by itself, nobody's going to produce ethanol because I'd rather feed my cattle. It's, it's more productive, right? Uh, and similarly, what happens if there are capacity constraints on producing the ethanol to try and make these markets come together? If there are those type of constraints, then the price of ethanol may disconnect from the price of corn, right, in a, in a very strange way, where ethanol gets bid up pretty high because they're not producing enough to actually come to this equilibrium, okay? Um, what this says, what this says, and I'll, I'll try and be as little mathematical as I can, the no ethanol price, or the price that would prevail if it just were not possible to make ethanol out of corn or out of sugar or whatever market we're talking about, biodiesel out of, out of you know, rapeseed, whatever you want, whatever that price is that would prevail ends up having these really huge implications for how these policies affect everybody in the market, right? And that's, that's really the key here. So if we take, for example, the, this ethanol uh, example, right? By assuming that things sort of equilibrate, we would assume then that the price of gasoline, once we convert it to a bushel equivalent, is going to be equal to you know, some coefficient, some constant that's essentially equal to how much ethanol you can pull out of a bushel of corn um, times this price of gas, OK? Divided by 1 minus delta. And what does this 1 minus delta come from? That's because you can cycle some of the byproduct back into the corn market. Same thing you can do with, with sugar cane. Same thing you can do with, uh, with rapeseed, whatever else. Okay? Um, is you get this very, very tight relationship. But that tight relationship only holds in certain circumstances. So thinking about this in terms of a supply-demand model that almost everybody should be somewhat familiar with, <laughs> right? What happens if, you know, if we have demand for non-ethanol and supply of corn, right? If there is no ethanol, that's what our price is going to be, okay? Now we run into if our price of gasoline converted to bushels 
is above that price, then we're going to have a very linked price, and we should see those prices move together all the time. If instead this price of gasoline falls below, right, they're not directly linked, unless you have some policy that forces them to be. For example, if you have the tax credit, and if that tax credit then for blending in ethanol creates this wedge between gas price and ethanol price, then you're going to end up with with ethanol and, uh, and gasoline prices being linked to corn prices, like before. Uh, but only if you have that wedge. And, and beyond that, you might ask yourself, well, what's the cost of this? The cost of this then um, ends up being that tax credit. And a lot of that tax credit doesn't actually go towards producing ethanol. A lot of that tax credit goes towards overcoming that deficit in the price of gasoline. Okay, that's probably a little bit more than you wanted to know. <laughs> What's my point? What's my point? Well, first off, ethanol and corn prices are only going to be linked in certain cases, okay? Uh, for example, if the tax credit is binding, if it actually creates ethanol when you, when you put that tax credit in place, it may disengage if the tax credit is not binding. For example, if you have a mandate that is fixing the amount of ethanol that needs to be produced, rather than allowing it to fluctuate with the market, right? Um, so we may still have some biofuels even without these markets being linked. We also may find capacity constraints and other things like that could have a big impact. Now, if the capacity constraints apply, right, then the cost of corn is going to be trivial, and so we don't find that equilibrium that we would otherwise. We find a giant rise in the price of ethanol relative to corn. Okay, one, one more little uh, graph, technical graph, let me say, and then I'll move on to other stuff that's a little more exciting. Uh, what, what, if, <laughs> what if we have a mandate? I, I argued this mandate would have uh, an, an issue of driving up that corn price um, in a way, or the ethanol price, I should say, in a way that can de-link from other things. And it, it does end up driving up the corn price, but it doesn't necessarily link it to the oil price. Right? So if we have this as our oil price, and let's just assume oil prices are fixed. We don't have a market for them. They're just a fixed price for them. Okay? And we have ethanol price, and we have some mandate that a certain percentage of our fuel has to be of, uh, of ethanol. Then that creates a separate sort of supply curve for a mixture of fuel. Okay? And how would we determine how much ethanol is going to be in the market? Well, we have the intersection of our supply of f mixture of fuel and the demand for that fuel. And whatever proportion of that that is mandated to be ethanol, that's how much ethanol you're going to have. And the price is going to be wherever that amount of ethanol is produced along the supply curve. And so it's not connected anymore to the oil price. And so you get that disconnect between fluctuations in oil prices and fluctuations in ethanol and corn prices. Now, there can be some bit of a link if, if we still have an upward sloping supply, but it's not the same sort of relationship that you imagined in that first slide where they just move in lockstep. Why is this important? I'm going to skip this slide. It's more complicated. <laughs> um, so ignore that part. Uh, the point. So mandates binding. Ethanol prices disengage from oil prices. And ethanol and corn prices are still going to be linked. So we should still see one of those links. We shouldn't see the other. And here's where we run into the problem. Virtually everybody in the room got confused when I started pointing out you know, different points on these slides and, and tried to explain these various lines to you. And I had a first day in grad school where I remembered something very similar. And because that's hard, what tends to happen is people instead just say, well, let's just suppose we have a supply and demand curve, and our ethanol policy is we're going to shift out the curve. <laughs> okay? Instead of thinking about when they link, when they delink, we're just going to shift out the curve, and it's going to be cheaper to produce ethanol than it was before because of whatever policy we put in place, whether it be mandate, tax credit, tariff, whatever. Okay? In fact, if you look, a large proportion of the literature looking at biofuels and the impact of biofuels uh, generally do exactly this, okay? And they started out back in the early you know, half of the 2000s trying to look at this to see what the impacts were going to be. 
and they simply looked for correlations between ethanol and oil and corn and ethanol to see if those correlations held. And if, if they held, then we're going to have a big impact on corn and, and you know, food prices and things like that. And if they don't, then we're not going to have that impact and we don't have to worry. OK, we, we, we call this a sort of manna from heaven theory that it just it, it doesn't uh, you know, it doesn't follow any sort of rational theory. Prices just are what they are. Well, this was the data that they were using in that first half and dozens and dozens of studies. And if you look at this here, we have our corn price in red and there we have our oil prices and ethanol prices. And oil and ethanol are loosely, loosely related, not very tight and corn not related at all. And it was long about, uh, oh, right here, that, uh, that we wrote down our theory on how these things really should work. And, and for the next several months, my co-author kept coming into my office, how come this doesn't work? <laughs> how come this, this doesn't work? And it was because of a lot of different things that were going on in the market. Right. So here we see the $40 barrel oil and it starts to link here. We, when we see these big spikes in oil, we see somewhat, you know, lagged response in ethanol, but not much response at all in corn. And what was going on? There was absolutely no capacity to create the ethanol that would allow those to link and to bring down the prices so they could actually link this, uh, this red, um, if you will, is corn prices, right? This blue, this represents ethanol plant capacity. Now these are on different scales, but what happened is long about here in 06, 07, we suddenly got a whole bunch of capacity and a whole bunch of ability to actually respond to market forces in ethanol. And before that, we couldn't. And because we couldn't, those prices were delinked. They didn't respond the way you would expect them to. And so we had dozens of studies saying, actually, there's no relationship. We can go ahead with whatever um, policy we want, and it's not going to impact, uh, if you will, um, food prices. It's not going to impact the hungry all across the world. OK, uh, let me skip this slide for now, because I, I want to get to this. This is what happened after that. OK. Uh, one of those lines is the line predicted by the theory I outlined, right? And the actual corn price in red. And if you look, you don't get theories that line up much better than that, <laughs> right? All up until 2007, September 2007, you would look at this and you'd say, these have nothing to do with one another. But if you look deeper at the theory, you might realize there was some underlying relationship. It just wasn't manifest at the time because of a situation we were in. OK, and I'm getting low on time as I'm reading it. So I'm going to skip ahead to some of the punchline. Um, OK, so a lot of people modeling this uh, based on the simple, you know, supply demand model. Two things happen. One, they say there's no link. And so we don't have to worry about food prices. Right. But the other thing that happens is then we had this giant run up in food prices. Right. Came in 2008 and came again very recently. We have these giant run up in prices coincident with giant runs up in in uh, in oil prices and ex post. They're trying to figure out what happened. And if you use the supply demand model, the very simple model, your counterfactual is all wrong. What you're comparing it to is all wrong because you're looking at just that intersection from the original uh, you know, supply and demand. And what's, what you're missing is that our policies created the capacity in the first place to respond to those things, that our policy created the market for ethanol in the very first place. And it was our policy that made it so that our food prices would respond so dramatically. That beta over one minus delta, the factor by which it responds, is something like a factor of three, OK? Which means we should see huge responses in food prices relative to oil prices. And you end up underestimating the actual impact of biofuel policy. And we've got a lot of papers in very good journals underestimating it because they assume such a simple model 
and don't get at the actual relationship underneath. In other words, they're watering down their results with everything pre-2006, okay? Um, it's the wrong counterfactual. They're comparing to that with this slide it out, right? So they're comparing to this when they should be looking at that first graph that has, you know, the thousand different lines on it where a counterfactual is actually no biofuels, no impact on prices whatsoever, right? The supply and demand curve are shifting around all the time based on everything else. And so they're, they're overestimating, excuse me, underestimating the results. How hard or how, uh, how big? So let's compare. Over here, you can, uh, we have the uh, welfare results if you just assume supply demand curves, okay? And you would think that our, our policy is giving us a benefit of about $5.8 billion by using that. If you use the correct counterfactual, it's actually uh, decreasing our welfare by about $7.6 billion, right? That's a pretty big swing. Uh, as well, you do something very similar looking at our, our policies uh, with respect to trade, right? And it's the same sort of thing, 5.4 billion versus negative 2.7 billion. In other words, when you model it right and you get the right counterfactual, the effects are actually much bigger than we think. We're sort of lulling ourselves to sleep by not modeling it correctly. Um, so. In other words, sometimes the details really do matter. Sometimes these sort of outside cases really do matter. And in particular, biofuel policies uh, can have these really substantially negative impacts that are not particularly apparent uh, on food prices, on other externalities, if we don't actually look very closely at what's going on in those markets. So, what, uh, what you might say that I'm working on right now is nailing down these details and trying to demonstrate with the studies that have been out there already that, uh, that once you start putting in this structure, these impacts are much, much bigger than we've recognized to date. And we need to take those into account. And I'll quit right there. <laughs>